In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Brenda Boss, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Bishop of the Southwest California Synod. That is the Synod that has Long Beach all the way up to Central California near the Atascadero sort of wine country area. We have about 109 churches. Uh, your Bishop, Deborah Hutterer, is one of my mentors and friends. Um, and it is just delightful to be here. Pastor Amalia and I have known each other for, I don't know, 15-ish years before either of us were ordained. So I know it's hard to imagine a time before your pastor was a pastor, but it is true that um, she has not always been a pastor, neither have I. I actually have not always been a Lutheran. At least Pastor Amalia can say she was born, baptized, raised Lutheran. Not me, not so much. Um, I actually have only been ordained less than 10 years, which tends to make my synod a little bit anxious. They thought with the white hair, I must have been a, you know, a pastor for 45 years. But the truth is, I have not. It is a delight to be with you this morning. My wife Janice and I are here moving our granddaughter from, one, from sort of south of Tucson into north of Tucson with her mother. And so we are just so happy to be here. Um, I am not a lifelong Lutheran. I was raised in an evangelical church and came to Lutheranism in my 40s. And what, one of the reasons that I really liked Lutheranism is that I really responded to the saint and sinner equally piece. That was a big part of what made sense for me. I was definitely raised that you were a good Christian or a bad Christian. And so to have my pastor be like, oh, that's not a thing, really helped me quite a bit. And so it's been um, interesting to become a Lutheran in the last 15, 20 years and really respond to the church year. Because it makes sense in terms of how we, our bodies, our, the, the, the uh, weather, the seasons, sort of move with what the church year does. Before I came in this morning, I said to Pastor Amalia, I said, does your church really get into Lent? And I think she thought it was a trick question, right? She was like, I mean, uh, yes. You know, I mean, in my church, when I was, before I was a bishop, I literally had to say, it's Lent now. And people would be like, oh, that's right. Shoot. Am I supposed to give up something? You know, we're wearing purple now. That was about as much as they understood. But what I really like about Lent and Advent is it's a time for some reflection. And that's so countercultural, isn't it? We just don't ever want to slow down and wonder what God is doing in our lives. We hate that. We'd rather just blow past all of the contemplation and just be in the place where we praise God and sing. That's, we would love that. And yet, the church twice a year, Advent and Lent, says, stop. Slow down. Think about what God is doing. And every first Sunday of Lent, we have this story of the baptism and the temptation of Jesus. And when I grew up, again, not Lutheran, so we don't have to blame any of the Lutheran pastors, but I certainly, every time we had the story of the temptation of Jesus, the pastor would say, be like Jesus, don't be tempted. Fortunately, Lutherans go, yeah, that's not a thing either. We can't be like Jesus because God, he was God in flesh. He was perfect. We are not. Another reason why I kind of dug Lutheranism, because I was told, look, you cannot be perfect. Calm down. So, in this first Sunday of Lent, we imagine Jesus, who's had sort of this high point of his life, his baptism, in which the heavens opened up and God said, this is my beloved son, 
We've had this amazing sort of beautiful, beautiful moment of his. And then immediately the spirit takes him into the wilderness and he wanders around for 40 days. I sometimes wonder about that. Did Jesus think, I need a minute? I've just had this great thing happen. I need to sort of let it in and journal about it and figure it out. I mean, is that what he was thinking? Or did he just start on a journey not knowing where he was going to go and ended up wandering for 40 days? You know, we often think it's like the Israelites wandering through the desert. Do they all have bumper stickers said, all those who wander are not lost? I mean, is that what Jesus was doing? Or was he actually a little bit lost? We don't like to think about that. But what if Jesus actually didn't know what was supposed to happen next? And God said, I need you to spend some time not knowing. God says that to me about every week. I need you to spend some time not knowing. I hate it. A lot of people figured I became bishop because I knew what I was doing. I might have even told them I knew what I was doing when I was elected. And they went, great, go do it. And about one day into it, I thought, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I think God said, good. Now you're getting somewhere. And so I wonder if Jesus needed to wander around in the wilderness, which is hard for us to imagine that maybe Jesus didn't know. But what if that was actually what God was calling Jesus to do? To realize that Jesus needed to be open and just put one foot in front of the other. When we um, are ordained, we are told God has called us to a path the end of which we do not know. The truth is, every Christian should be told that at the baptismal font. You have been selected. You have been set free. Everything else is up for grabs. I, I, I would be comforted knowing that. When I became a pastor, there was an adult who was baptized at 65, and after about a, a month after she was baptized, she said to me, I thought my life was going to be better. I said, oh no, did I tell you that? Because I should give up my collar if I led you to believe that after you were baptized, life was perfect. And she said, no, somehow I just thought it would be. We sometimes think that, that maybe following God is going to make our lives better. And frankly, I like to come on to church on Sunday and be reminded, not so much. Because then I feel a little bit better about my own struggles. The truth is, the sermon I wanted to preach to you today was not about Jesus in the wilderness. But I thought I should talk about Jesus, because we're supposed to in church. But what I really was thinking about was Noah and his family in that stupid ark. Again, Noah and the ark, a delightful children's story. How fabulous. And every, you know, when I was a pastor with a preschool, we'd always act out the ark and two kids would be monkeys and two kids would be gorillas and two kids would be tr tigers and they'd all come down the center aisle during preschool chapel and oh, it was adorable. But what about Noah and his family? God said to Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. I've had it. I mean, that's literally what God says. I've had it with you people. I'm going to start over. And God says to Noah, you're going to build an ark. I'm going to tell you how. And Noah spends several years, years building this huge boat. And people make fun of him. And people tease him. He probably loses all of his friends. And he builds this huge boat. And then God says, and put two of every living creature in it. Which, again, we go, how cool is that? That had to have been a nightmare. Having to sort of wrangle every creature that he could find, stick them in the boat, and then the Bible says, and God closed the door. Now, ever, again, maybe from adorable children's stories that I've heard, we imagine they're sitting there with their, um, you know, their torches and maybe a good Wi-Fi connection, and they're all in the boat, and it's okay. Probably not. It was probably this cramped, really dark, pretty quickly stinky place. And remember, the Bible says that Noah couldn't let the dove out until after the 40 days of rain, and then they had to wait for it to dry enough, and they had to unseal the ark to let the birds out. That means that they were all locked inside. There's no standing on the deck and pretending that you're from the Titanic, I'm king of the world. There was none of that. 
They were in this terrible, dark, hot, smelly place, wondering what that thing is crawling up my leg. And Noah had to say, did I hear God right? I, I, I was listening to God, and this is terrible. This is terrible. God said, I was the chosen one. God said, I was the faithful one. I'm the only one left on the planet, me and my family. This was supposed to be great. And I'm sitting in the dark, surrounded by animals, with my wife asking us how much longer until we get there. We never think about that part. Noah had to wonder, did I misunderstand? God said it would be okay, and this is the opposite of okay. That's the message that I wanted to send this first Sunday of Lent. I, I, I don't know you, but I thought I would go for it, right? There are times when we think, did I misunderstand God? Because I'm being faithful, and this is terrible. And to me, that's an acknowledgement at Lent. Sometimes it's terrible. And then the sun comes out. And then there's a rainbow. And as was read today, God promises, God promises, I'm not going to destroy you. God promises there will be a future. God promises to be with us. And I just wonder what it was like to be in that ark, in the dark, in the stink, and wonder what was happening. And if every now and then God' presence, God's presence was made known. And Noah had to think, how is that possible? In my doubt, in my resentment, in my fear, suddenly I feel a bit calmer. <clears throat> suddenly, I believe that maybe it's going to be okay. This is my prayer for you as well. Sometimes we're wandering. Sometimes we're stuck in an uncomfortable situation. But here on this first Sunday of Lent, I believe the Bible because the Bible tells the truth about the human condition is not always perfect. That's why I actually am a Christian, because it wasn't a promise that it was always going to be great. It was actually an assurance that sometimes it's not okay. And God is here. And so this Lenten journey, I pray, is for you to be reminded of that. If you're wandering and you're not sure where you're going, remember, same thing happened to Jesus, and then God used him for great things. If you feel stuck in a horrible situation, remember, same thing happened to Noah, and God was with him. And Noah was the first human to ever see a rainbow. So what's coming for you? Some of you say, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, don't, have the, I don't have the faith today. It's okay. There's a lot of people in the room. If you're having a hard time with faith, there are others in the room who will believe for you until you can come back around. And there will be days when your honesty, your compassion, your prayer, your kindness, your, your authenticity will be the blessing that somebody else needs. That's what it is to be church together here as we enter this Lenten journey. God bless you and God bless your faithfulness. Amen. Amen.